All right, here is part two of your arthropod diversity, and this video will focus solely on the insects. So first up, subphylum Myriapoda. So this are what you commonly know as centipedes and millipedes. It means 10,000 foot. There's two major classes, so diplopoda is millipedes, chilopoda is centipedes. They are terrestrial, although they do require moist habitats because they don't have an exoskeleton. So they can't keep the water inside their bodies. So they don't have that waxy covering on that exoskeleton like other animals do. So they need to be in a moist habitat. They have two body segments, the head and the trunk. So a couple key differences between them. So millipedes are mostly round. And these are the ones that roll into a ball when threatened. Not roly polies, but similar. Now, your centipedes are fast moving. These ones typically have longer legs, those big antenna, and they actually have poison claws. Although it's not poisonous to humans, or not enough to do damage to humans. And they are predators. Next up is subphylum hexapoda. So hex, six, so means six foot. They are the most successful land animals in terms of the number of species and the individuals. Their bodies are divided into three tagmata, which are those divisions that all arthropods have. They have five pairs of head appendages, and then they have three pairs of legs on the thorax. Also, as you notice here and here and here, many have wings. and one antenna pair. So class Insecta is what we're mostly going to focus on. So class Insecta, there's actually 30 orders within this class. An adult insect is characterized by a few major things. So first of all, the body is divided into a head, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. They have three pairs of legs, so you see one, two, three, and two pairs of wings, so kind of an upper and a lower. <clears throat> Their head has a single pair of antenna that we talked about. They have all those varying mouth parts. They have compound eyes, so they can see better than just animals that have those simple eyes, but they also have the simple eyes. They have the thorax, which has three segments, so a prothorax, a mesothorax, and a metathorax. And then one pair of legs attaches to each one of these segments above. All three of those segments make up the thorax. And then the wings attach at the margin between the meso and the meta. So right in there would be where the wings would attach. So the thorax, say on the grasshopper, is here. The wings are attaching somewhere in the middle, technically. And then the abdomen has 10 to 11 abdominal segments, and they have lateral folds. Okay, these folds allow for two things. So expansion is, is what they allow for, but two reasons for ex expansion. Oh, boy. We'll start. So either for eggs, if it's a female, or if they eat too much. So insect flight. So insects are known primarily for their flying and they use many forms of locomotion in addition to flying. So they can walk, run, jump, swim, but flight is arguably the most important. They were actually the first animals to fly, which is very important from an evolutionary perspective because you have to think about what flying did for them. They could move, so they could go further places to gather food, escape predators, etc. And the wings most likely evolved from outgrowths of the thorax, which is what protects the legs. 
So they also require thermal regulation, which means they need a 25 degrees Celsius or higher body temp. So a minimum of 25 degrees. And they can use two types of flight. So synchronous or direct flight or asynchronous or indirect flight. And we'll examine those on the next slide. So here's a way to compare them. So synchronous or direct examples to think about. Butterflies, dragonflies, grasshoppers. These flight muscles act on a wing base and they have a single wing cycle. Okay? The indirect flight or the asynchronous flight is used by flies and wasps. This acts on a body wall. So the thorax actually changes shape, causing the wings to move, and they have many cycles of wings. It's also important to note that both types of insects have muscles to control the tilt as well. So insect feeding. So I mentioned the mouth parts earlier. So there's five major parts to the mouth of an insect, which you will see in this diagram over here. So first of all, we have the clypeus, which just supports the muscles. So that's right there. The labrum is the upper lip-like structure, so it's important to not get the two confused. So there's a labrum, which is upper, and then a labium, which is lower. So labrum is upper. The mandible, these are the chewing mouth parts. Most people recognize the term mandible. And then maxillae, these have the cutting surfaces. This is what helps chew the food or cut off the food. And then the labium is that sensory lower lip. It's important to note as well that all of these parts aid in food handling. And they are modified because not all insects chew their prey. So they are modified for insects that suck or siphon liquid food or nectar. So their digestive system is a long and straight system, and they also have three parts, similar to other arthropods. So the foregut <clears throat> is behind the pharynx, and that also has a crop used for storage, but it also has a gizzard, which helps grind. You may recognize these terms from the earthworm. The midgut aids in digestion and absorption, and it also has something known as gastric cissae, which helps that surface area of digestion and absorption. And then the hindgut is primarily for reabsorption of water. So water is very important to insects because that's how they keep their body functions working. So the hindgut working with this reabsorption is very important. The gas exchange, so they require a large surface area for this diffusion. So there's highly branched systems within insects called tracheae and their chitin line tubes or chitin line tubes sorry so tracheae they open to the outside of the body through spiracles keep in mind once again spiracles but it's preventing water loss it's very important that insects conserve water and then most insects also have ventilating mechanisms so that moves air in and out it contracts the flight muscles for some insects. It also draws air up like a vacuum, and it contracts the abdominals like a pump. Insect circulation, once again, relates back to that hemocell that all arthropods share. They have an open circular, circulatory system, but it's important to note that the blood vessels are less developed. So the blood carries nutrients, hormones, waste, and it's not important in gas exchange. So most insects are ectotherms, but some do generate heat using flight muscles. They can actually generate from 0 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius using their wing muscles. They warm themselves by basking in the sun. So maybe you see more flies in your house, for example, on sunny days because they come out and they sit on the windows. Um, and then they cool by going to moist environments. And also, just kind of fun fact, is honeybees actually heat their hive using their wings. So just an example. So sensory functions. Insects are also pretty 
cool too and that they have memory and they can learn things. So they have some learning and they can have a memory. They have something called a ganglion which makes this more possible than it does in other organisms. And they have their sense organs are specialized to function well on land. So bees, for example, recognize flower-like objects and when they get nectar, they keep choosing flowers that have that same odor. So they have learned that, oh, this looks like a flower. It must have that really good pollen that I found on this other one that looked like this, so I'm going to go here. They can also detect light, so they're capable of detecting light to use it for orientation, Oops. orientation, navigation, feeding. And like we said earlier, they have compound eyes, which are very well developed in the adults. So social insects. So... Many insects have very social lives, so especially those that live in colonies. Perhaps you're most familiar with bees, but also wasps, ants, and termites all have colonies. And each type of individual within is called a cast. So there's three or four types per colony. So here's just a general overview of those types that could exist. The reproductive females are the queens. The workers are sterile, can be male or female, it depends. They're usually female in bees, but in termites they're males and females. You have reproductive males, which inseminate the queen, that's all they do, they're called kings. And then soldiers, which defend the colony, and kind of interesting, soldiers have larger mandibles than the other ones in the colony to help with that defense. But it's important to see that they're also sterile, so they can't inseminate the queen, only these reproductive males up here can Jobs are assigned by age, so younger ones stay close to the colony and the older ones leave for food, kind of like in any other social structure of an animal. The younger ones are taught the ways before they're allowed to venture away from the rest of the group. And the queen releases a pheromone to control this system. So if she dies, her royal food, her food, which is known as royal jelly, is fed to other female larvae to develop a queen, and then they will fight to the death to determine who gets to rule. And one final thing is just insects and humans. So insects kind of have a bad reputation with humans, but in reality, only 0.5% of them negatively affect humans. They provide many valuable things for us, wax, honey, silk, and they pollinate 75% of all plants. So the value of this in the U.S. alone is $19 million of insect-pollinated crops. And they do provide biologic control of other things and soil benefits. Yes, there are negatives. They can be parasitic to humans and animals, and they can transmit diseases. But once again, that traces back to really only that 0.5% of insects that negatively affect us.